About 10 years ago, I was involved in a research program for heart transplantation. And it was this research that got me started to think about the effects chemotherapy has on the heart's ability to survive. This program involved a company that had a proprietary solution for heart transplantation. They would prepare a heart, treat it with their solution, preserve it by putting it on ice, the solution would stop the heart from beating, and they would ship that heart to me here in Columbus, Ohio. I would receive the heart, and then my portion of the research was to revive it. So I would do that by placing the heart on an apparatus, supplying it with fluid that contained the nutrients that it would need to survive, but also increasing the temperature because this heart had been preserved on ice. That temperature would then come up to our body's temperature of 98.6 degrees. So the interesting part is, over several minutes, the fluid would go through the heart, giving it its nutrition, warming it up, and washing out the transplant solution. Over several minutes, that heart would start to beat. Now, what you may know is there's a heart transplant list. But what you might not know is that transplanted organs have a shelf life. And at the time of this research, a heart had to be transplanted three to four hours after it was removed. So if you were living in Columbus, Ohio, and you were in need of a heart transplant, and the only heart available was in Europe, there would be no time to get the heart to that patient. We were reviving hearts 24 hours after they were transplanted. So, thereby eliminating geographical location of the patient as a limiting factor for that person to receive a healthy heart if one became available. So it was the realization I had from this research, I started formulating this question right here. Why do some hearts last longer than others? And as my career progressed and I started doing research on anti-cancer medicine, this question actually changed to, why do some cancer patient hearts not last as long as non-cancer patient hearts? This is the critical statement. It's a very powerful statement, and I'm sure as you're reading it now, it means something to each of us in different ways. But to a cancer survivor that has been treated with chemotherapy, this statement is truly impactful. And the question I'm asking is, does their survival have to have consequences related to the treatment? So you heard from Nancy that I'm a safety pharmacologist at Patel. And as a safety pharmacologist, my job is to oversee drugs in development and the effect they have on the vital systems within our body. And I focus on the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, and the central nervous system. So it's not surprising that these vital systems are very sophisticated and the research that we're doing is highly specialized. But in short, I'm focused on keeping you safe from the unwanted side effects of medicine. Now, I really want to cover three things today, which is the relationship that anti-cancer medicine has on damaging your heart, an overview of the drug development process so you can understand why this might be what it is, and lastly, what I'm doing in research to identify tools to not only help with treatment, but for survival. So let's explore what my research is showing us. Let's start with the good news. Cancer patients are surviving. They're surviving longer than they have in the past. And that's due to advances not only in diagnosis, but also in treatment. And it's really about 50% for each. And if you look, the relative survival, this is a study that was done by the National Cancer Institute, the relative survival for all cancer five years after diagnosis has gone up from 50% to 66%. You might not think that that's a large jump, but it truly is. And I broke, out, I broke out a couple other points. For females, breast cancer has gone up to almost 90% survival five years after diagnosis. And then for men, prostate cancer, we're actually at 100% survival five years post-diagnosis. Now, granted, this is a subset of the population, but I can tell you that these trends are continuing today. So there are recent headlines. If you look in the, in the internet, I've got some newspaper clippings here. There's an interaction between the drug treatment and heart damage. So I think I need to tell you just a few minutes about what drugs do when we give them generally. Because you might be thinking, why are we developing drugs that could potentially harm our heart? Are you thinking that? Because I was. So in general, I just wanted to give you this description. Drugs work by affecting processes in our body. 
And the example I can give you is, most of us get aches and pains, and you might take Advil to alleviate that pain. Advil goes into our body, goes through our blood, and all you notice is that the pain in your arm went away. But the Advil went all over your body. Whether you had pain in your knee or not, it went there and bound to the receptors. Some cancer medicine does the same thing. The difference is with cancer, the process that allows cancer to grow is similar to normal processes in healthy, functioning tissue. And one of those is the heart. So let me give you an example of this another way, maybe a non-medical way. If you're driving in a car down a road, and the road is the pathway that leads to normal function, and that road has an intersection with a light, let's just say for this argument that the light, when it's green, that means that the cancer cells are growing and the heart cells are functioning normally. Now we add cancer drugs to the discussion. Enter that into the body. You're driving down that same road, and you've got this light now is red. So now the pathway is interrupted, which is a good thing for cancer because now the cancer cells aren't growing. The bad thing for the heart is now the heart cells are acting abnormally. So this disruption in the normal process is what is the unwanted side effects that, we, that happens when we take medicine. So here's the reality. Because of that, we have a, a, aggressive cancer. We need aggressive treatment. So with some treatments, heart function decreases. So while you're going through therapy, your heart function decreases. And what that means to you is the heart cannot match the supply the body needs. So its function is decreased. The interesting part there is when you come off of therapy, within months after therapy, heart function returns for most people. Now, there is a little bit of, I guess, imbalance there, which is the heart either comes back to normal or it does not. And if it does not, we have a, we have a strategy in how to treat that. The problem is 15%, up to 15% of patients treated will develop irreversible heart damage. And again, that manifests itself in two ways. Treatment ends, heart function doesn't come back, we treat it. Treatment comes back, heart function comes back, and we don't see any re residual damage. The bad news is the damage is lying underneath in the cell and presents itself years later, upwards of 10 years later. And because of that, there are 2 million people in the US alone that are at risk today to develop delayed cardiac injury due to treatment. And that delay manifests itself at a time 10 years later when you start to see your heart failing. And I have to tell you, right now, we're not sure why that happens. So I wanted to go into a little bit about what's happening in the drug development process to see what we can do to change it. This diagram is showing you a funnel that bends along in time. And it takes about 15 years to get a drug to the market and about a billion dollars. It might even be more than that. What I want to point out on the screen, you'll see that there's 5,000 or 10,000 chemicals in the upper left-hand side, one on the lower right-hand side. That's how many chemicals is needed to get one drug to the market in that 15-year process. Now, at any given time, and as of today, there are 800 molecules in development in this process for anti-cancer therapy. Now, what's interesting about this is this is regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, and their main job is to really look at, is the drug effective at treating it what it's supposed to treat, and is it safe? So there are guidelines that the FDA has in place throughout this development process. And some of those guidelines for normal drugs have cardiovascular safety. As you can see, there's safety pharmacology there. And then you monitor cardiac safety through the clinic. However, with anti-cancer medicine, those guidelines are modified. And they're modified so that you reduce the surveillance of cardiac function during development. And it makes sense when, when cancer was truly unbeatable, it makes sense that we wanted to get drugs to people that needed them immediately. The problem is this culture that the FDA has created is focused on treatment and not survival. So that's what I'm focused on and that's what drives my daily work. If you can look here at about four years into the process when safety pharmacology is being conducted, Four years in, you're spending tens to twenties million dollars. And for anti-cancer drugs, it's not until about 10 years out that you start monitoring in the clinic. That's where you get all your data on cardiac function with this type of drug. At this point, you're in the hundreds of millions of dollars spent. So there's a lot of investment up until this point. 
And I have to tell you, this process, as you see here, does not detect the latent injury that we're seeing 10 years after treatment. So I want to tell you a story. And the story I want to tell you is we need to generate better tools within drug development so that we can detect these injuries. Particularly when we know the class of drug causes it, we should be spending time trying to figure out why. So in order to do that, we need to arm ourselves with better tools. Society demands that we have these tools to detect this. So I gave a little prelude with a fast finger twitch of Seldane, if you've seen it. So I'm going to switch gears because I want to show you an example of where this worked, where we identified a tool to help the drug development process. So people in the audience suffering from allergies, right? It's quite a few. So you saw the lead-in. Seldane, for the ones, this is the, somewhere in the 90s, do you, do you recall this drug, anyone? So this was an antihistamine that I believe was first in class to be used as a non-drowsy antihistamine. So you take it whenever you want it. The difference is, is it caused sudden death in some patients. <laughs> Immediately removed from the market. So you might know it's, it's gone. So if you used it and it worked well, it went away. But the death was caused by an abnormal heart rhythm. And this heart, abnormal heart rhythm has a specific name because it, it decays to death, but it, sometimes it kicks back to normal rhythm. So if you felt poorly and you were still alive to go to the doctor, it usually meant it was back to normal rhythm and the doctor couldn't diagnose it. Made it very difficult to figure out. However, researchers investigating the EKG of these patients identified a change in that EKG. And when we do that, we call that identifier a biomarker. So in this case, researchers then put this biomarker in drug development, in the safety pharmacology studies that we do to detect it so that we would reduce the risk of allowing that drug to make it to patients in the future. So here's an example of not only identifying a tool, but putting it in the drug development process and changing that process so we prevent more people from dying from taking an antihistamine. So the, the good news of this, if there is any, is that the active metabolite within Seldane had no cardiovascular side effects, but was just as, as an effective antihistamine as Seldane. And that drug is still on the market. So that's how we, we the drug company actually made Seldane, figured this problem out, came out with Allegra, and now this is, this is safe. An example of the electrical component of the heart, the heart's ability to contract is what we need to investigate with anti-cancer drugs. So here's an example for electrical component. What we need to know is what's happening when the heart's contracting, the actual muscle that's contracting. So here's the hope, is that we are assessing the mechanical contraction of the heart. And to do that, during safety pharmacology studies, it's not, it's in the guidelines, excuse me, in safety pharmacology studies, blood pressure is what we measure, not the heart, heart's contraction. So if we've all had blood pressure taken at the doctor, or if you've put your arm in that machine at CVS, the blood pressure cuff inflates and tells you what the blood pressure is in your arm. That top number is the number in pressure that the heart has to generate to eject blood. So that's why the doctor uses it. It gives you an in incline into what the heart's doing. But it doesn't tell you anything about the force at which you need to generate to get that blood out. So I'll give you an example. If you drive a car and you have an oil gauge in your car on your dashboard, we probably don't look at it that often, it, it's going to tell you either the pressure of the oil or the temperature of the oil. It doesn't tell you anything about the horsepower in which the engine is putting out. Same thing here. You can measure blood pressure. It's a good indicator of certain things, but it doesn't tell you anything about the force of contraction. So here's the hope. At Patel, we're actually investigating the force of contraction. And with that, we're investigating the force of contraction using that same device I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, however, with more sophistication. Because we're also measuring the pathway in which energy travels to get to the heart to contract. And by doing that, we can investigate if there's a, a, an imbalance in the amount of energy that's delivered versus the force of contraction. And here's why that's important. I'm going to make you do an exercise. I don't know how to do it other than virtually. I want you in your mind to start sprinting. I know. Try it. Sprint as fast as you can in your mind. At some point, you have to slow down, right? You run out of energy and you slow down. The thing here is energy goes down, the cells involved in your leg to make you run start acting abnormal, which if enough of them are affected, your muscles stop acting normally and you slow down. The good news is you can make a decision 
to stop, right? You've, everyone watched the Olympics this summer. Every sprinter, when they finished, laid on the ground. Did you notice that? They were out of energy. Once they hit the tape, they hit the ground. And if you're really feeling bad from this mental exercise we did, you can take tomorrow off. <laughs> but your heart pumps 80 times a minute every minute of your life. It doesn't get a chance to rest. So if there's a small imbalance in the energy that's going to it, when it's forcefully contracting at the same rate, something has to give. And over time, that small change results in damage. So again, think about the small insight we're gaining, or I mean the large insight we're gaining by these very, very small changes. And, and think about the tools we are now adding to the drug development process as far as safety assessment. If we were to test new drugs today for anti-cancer treatment, we can start putting these, these tests to the test to see if we can predict what currently today we cannot. So, what I should say is, none of this information that I'm telling you today should ever make us want to stop surviving. And I don't think it will. And I actually think, personally, that when it, when it comes to our health, that we make the decisions we do based on the current research, the ongoing research, and the next big discovery, and I think those things influence our, our decisions that we make about our survival. I just think that's inherent in what we're doing. What's interesting is that if, well, let me just leave you with this. There are people in the world, and probably in this room, that work tirelessly daily to raise money and awareness for a cure to cancer. And what I want you guys to know is that what I'm doing at Patel, what this group is doing at Patel, is we are working just as vigorously so that the drugs that you take, the medicines that you take, will be safe and then we can all enjoy survival. And I'll end with that. Thank you.